May 1984, a woman is approached while enjoying a drink at a local bar. Days later, a man offers to fix a young woman's stalled car. Elsewhere, another woman is leaving a mall on the outskirts of Tulsa, Oklahoma, when a man approaches. None of the women are ever seen again. They really didn't have any key suspects. Uh, we were looking for individuals, possibly family members that might have been angry. We had the elements of a serial killer, a crime spree, a chase. For the people of Oklahoma, it is an unprecedented set of events. When people start showing up dead every few days, it scared the whole town and the whole area. Along with police, there are those who chronicle the investigation up close, on film, on paper, and on tape. They are the public's first witness. Through their lens, they capture our darkest chapters of crime. In 1984, Tulsa, Oklahoma is a former oil capital that has hit an economic slump, but it still has a reliable resource in its people. Everybody knows everybody. A lot of people left their doors unlocked, their windows unlocked, and it was a place where you really enjoyed to live and it was a great community. We have a couple of religious universities here in town and uh, conservative people, family people. That also describes the smaller communities nearby, like Broken Arrow. Crime rate was rather low. You had your typical burglaries and, and that type of crimes, but as far as homicides and that type of major crimes, it was a real low for this area. In May, 63-year-old Eddie Cash is doing what he loves, helping the sick and needy. He was very compassionate, very caring about people. He was always helping people. And he had developed a ministry to sick and shut in people, especially people in nursing homes. He visited them almost every day. A widower for three years, he has just retired from his caretaking job at a local cemetery and is always looking for conversation. Dad would come to my house in the mornings, right about the time my kids were getting up and getting ready to leave, for, have breakfast and leave for school. And he'd either have coffee with them or help them do their breakfast because I'd be getting ready to go to work. May 7th, Eddie is on his way to visit a sick relative in Collinsville, Oklahoma. While driving down the highway, he spots a hitchhiker who also happens to be heading to the same small town. As he has done for many others, he offers him a ride. He uh, would always pick up hitchhikers, especially if he was traveling alone. He would pick up people. During the trip, he tells the stranger about his life and his home. Dropping him off, Eddie goes on his way. He visited some family and friends and returned to his residence in Broken Arrow. The next morning, Eddie Cash's daughter waits for his morning visit, but he doesn't show up. I had tried to call when I first got up to see if he was home, and the phone rang and rang and rang, and I picked up the phone and called again, and the phone rang busy. I called work, and I said, I'm going to be late. I've gone to my dad's house. I haven't seen him, and I'm going to go check on him. When she arrives at the house, Priscilla sees that his van is nowhere in sight. When I opened the front door, he was laying inside the front door in a pool of blood. And I was the one that called 911. Police immediately converge on the crime scene. Lead detectives Rick Ross and Homer Miller take charge and put their team of investigators to work. Immediately, they set up a perimeter around the area, around the house, and called for additional officers. Outside, they notice that Cash's van is missing. Inside, Eddie Cash has been beaten on the head and strangled. 
Detectives take photographs of the body and document the entire crime scene. They then set about collecting vital evidence. Fingerprints, bloody footprints, hairs, fibers, the brick that we believe was used to strike Mr. Cash with. Meanwhile, Ed Cash Jr. is informed of his father's death. I was working on a job in Tulsa and uh, had left for lunch and came back and my aunt was sitting there. Well, I knew immediately when I saw her there's something wrong. She was very to the point. She just said, you need to sit down. I have something that I have to tell you. And she said, your father has been murdered. I became very angry, very upset. <laughs> Ed Cash Jr. races to his father's home. The media is also on the scene. Photographers and reporters clamor for any bit of information to publish. Any killings are big news in Tulsa. Officer Paul Crowder is one of the detectives assigned to canvas the neighborhood for more information. We located a couple of witnesses that recalled seeing two young men and they were asking for directions to Mr. Cash's residence. And the witness recalled a unusual belt buckle that one of those individuals was wearing. As a close relative, Ed Cash Jr. becomes a suspect. They were doing a thorough investigation. They were eliminating anyone that might have been involved. I realized immediately that I was a suspect because of the questions they were asking. Where I was, could I prove where I was? Because usually people kill people they know. We were looking for individuals, possibly family members that might have uh, been angry with Mr. Cash, and none of those leads uh, or trails panned out. Although he is soon cleared of suspicion, when Ed Cash Jr. arrives at his own home, he realizes that the nightmare is far from over. The evening of the funeral, we'd been gone two or three days, and I walked up on the deck, and the television was on. I, I remember distinctly not leaving a TV on, only a light. I started to put the key in the lock, <laughs> and heard someone call. Ed quickly retreats to a neighbor's house where he phones police and borrows some weapons. Returning to his home armed and ready, he sees a man fleeing into the woods. I felt very angry about it. Extremely angry about it. And was very uncomfortable thinking that he could very easily come back. Inside, Ed Cash Jr. finds that his rifles are wrapped in a sheet. The next morning, police dust the guns for fingerprints and compare them to the suspect's prints taken from the murder scene. They find they are one and the same. From a fingerprint on one of the rifles that was in the house, they said they were reasonably sure that it was him. But detectives Ross and Miller still don't know who they belong to. And with no suspects, their investigation only goes so far. They came to a dead end because they were not able to identify the fingerprints through sources that they had available to them at the time. I figured they would eventually catch him because the thing that I was concerned about was my sister and my immediate family. I was very concerned that he had gotten information that would lead him to one of us. While the Eddie Cash incident has been unfolding, in the nearby community of Poto, Oklahoma, a man approaches 36-year-old Margaret Bell in a bar and strikes up a conversation. My mom was probably the true image of a hippie a very intelligent person, um, very open-minded, liked everybody and loved life. She had just moved back to Poto to be closer to 
friends and family because this is where she grew up. Margaret's daughter, Misty, is especially proud that her mother has been a radio DJ working for the family-owned radio station. My grandfather's radio station was on downtown of Poto. And you could see in and see the studio. And I can remember people walking by and seeing her and just thinking it was so cool that they could see her in there and know that she was my mother. Margaret's car has just come out of the shop and she's anxious to meet some friends. She tells Misty she plans to stop off at one of her favorite nightclubs later that night and that she will see her the next day. I then went by there Wednesday and someone had left a note on her door. So I left a note also. I then went by there Thursday and both the notes were still there. By that Sunday, I had gone several times to the house and all the notes were still there and more. I got real uneasy. Misty and her grandmother go to the police to file a missing persons report. I was very uneasy about filling them out because I had in my mind, I already knew something was bad wrong. When the family came in, information was taken about Miss Bell and at that point it was put on the national computer as a, to check her welfare and different agencies were notified to be on, on the lookout. However, at the time, there is not enough evidence to suggest something has gone wrong. At that point, we really didn't uh, have any reason to suspect, you know, any foul play. Initially, we thought she might have just went somewhere and stayed and was just late getting away or getting back home. When another 24 hours pass, Detective Steve Tiffy visits Margaret's house to see if anything points to where she might be. We found some credit card bills at the residence, so at that point we notified the credit card company and uh, we learned that the cards had been used in some different states. So we did follow ups on those credit card uses and trailed it out to a location where we thought she might be headed. But the promising lead does little to console Misty. Mom hadn't called, we hadn't seen her, things were left undone. My grandmother was like, you know, at telling me don't be a pessimist. And I told her I wasn't, I was being a realist. And it wasn't gonna have a happy ending. While the search for Margaret Bell continues, a woman is giving a man a tour of her house in the small town of Vanita, Oklahoma. Jane Hilburn is showing it to a man who says he is interested in buying it. A few hours later, her family comes home and finds Jane's dead body lying on the floor of the living room. A team of detectives arrive on the scene. From the evidence, the medical examiner easily determines what happened. As in the cases of Eddie Cash and Margaret Bell, Jane Hilburn's car is missing. He struck her in the head and strangled her and then took her Camaro uh, really, the only difference was the victim in Broken Arrow was a male, and the one in, in the Vanita area was a female. Five days later, a young woman contacts the police with a terrifying story. While hitchhiking, she is picked up by a man driving a Camaro. Suddenly, he has a knife at the girl's throat. He throws her in the trunk, drives her to a deserted location, and rapes her. When she promises she won't escape, he lets her sit in the car. When he stops at a bar, she runs for her life. A manhunt for the driver of the Camaro begins. A car matching the one described by the rape victim is found three days later. Police impound it and dust it for fingerprints. While police are trying to identify the prince, 32-year-old Janet Jewell parks her car in downtown Tulsa and goes into a store, unaware that someone is watching her. 
When she comes out, her car won't start, but a passerby offers to check under the hood. The next day, Jenna Jewell's car is parked at one of Tulsa's shopping malls. Another young woman leaves the mall and heads for the parking lot, anxious to get home. Things will not turn out as she plans. In the spring of 1984, communities in Oklahoma are concerned. In just a matter of days, two people have been murdered and several others have been kidnapped and raped. 25-year-old Valerie Shaw Hartzell, a high-profile radio reporter from Tulsa, has been watching the news with great interest. Good reporter, always upbeat, competent. I worked at a different radio station. She worked for a rival station, but it was a friendly rivalry. We were in the same broadcast courses at the University of Tulsa really nice person. She was very strong-willed, had an opinion. She was very confident about herself. She is also a friend of Ed Cash Jr. We used to go out to disco places dancing a lot with the group. And uh, then she met the man that she married on May 24, 1984, Valerie's husband has been waiting for her to return from the mall. She has gone to buy diapers for their newborn baby and should have been back hours before. When Valerie doesn't come home for dinner, he becomes worried and calls police. I was in charge of the Missing Persons Bureau. I made contact with her husband. Uh, in fact, I made the original missing persons report and took over the investigation. As more hours pass, the family becomes frantic. I went outside and I just started screaming and crying that uh, somebody had her. And it was just, you know, one of those uh, shocking moments where you're just screaming and crying. Meanwhile, Police talk to witnesses who remember seeing the high-profile reporter the previous day. She had been seen coming out of a store after she'd gone to buy uh, diapers for her baby. And that a man approached her and subsequently uh, drove off with her. While searching the scene, police find an abandoned car in the parking lot of the mall where Valerie disappeared. When police check it out, they realize Valerie's disappearance must be tied to another missing woman, Janet Jewell. The first time we actually put them together is when we found Janet Jewell's car on the parking lot at the Town West Shopping Center. Once that happened, then we discovered that they something bad happened to both of them. When news of her abduction becomes public, the community is stunned especially in the Tulsa newsrooms, where Valerie Shaw Hartzell has become the focus of the kind of story she herself would be covering. When we saw Valerie's name up on the assignment board, you know, as a story, not as just a person, it just changed your whole feeling that day. All of a sudden, it was like, whoa, this is hitting really close to home. The newsroom was pretty solemn. I mean, it's, it's surreal almost. It's like um, it's a television show. It's like it's not really happening. Meanwhile, Valerie has been cashing checks at several drive through banks. A teller recognizes Valerie from the media reports and calls police. Unfortunately, we didn't get that information quick enough to be able to get over there and possibly intervene. We were given access to their surveillance film, and that's where we did determine that, yes, that was uh, Ms. Hartzell in the truck, and that there was a uh, unidentified uh, white male in the truck with her. Don Spillers notes that in the films, Valerie looks anxious and uncomfortable. His fellow officers agree that she is not acting out of her own free will. The man in the video matches all the eyewitness descriptions 
but they still cannot ID him. Police continue their massive search while family members do what they can to help. My husband and I actually, we just got in a car and just drove around. There was no way to know where to look, so we just drove a lot and tried to go by instinct or feel. But for Ed Cash Jr., it is especially difficult. Within a matter of days, his father has been murdered, and now a friend has gone missing. He cannot help but believe they must be connected. Well, I definitely felt, you know, it has to be someone that I know. And I started immediately thinking of people that, that I knew that had met my father, that had traveled in the group with Valerie and myself. Then caused me to start feeling very uneasy. The way I was really feeling is that I want to get involved in this. I want to find out who it is because I, I want to take care of it. Unlike Ed, most Oklahomans are hoping not to get involved. They were frightened, and especially out west of Tulsa, uh, those people were scared. I think they started locking their doors maybe for the first time ever. I think it was at that point they finally made the connection that it's not just Valerie that this person has abducted or done anything to, that this was somebody who was a serial murderer at that point. By now, it is May 27th, three days after she has gone missing, and Valerie is still nowhere to be found. There are still no strong leads in the Eddie Cash murder or Margaret Bell's disappearance. Police only know that Valerie Shaw Hartzell and Janet Jewell have been abducted by the same person. Then, police receive a frantic phone call from a young woman in Vanita who tells police about a man who abducted her at knife point. She called the police right after it happened. He ended up taking her to a, a motel where he raped her. And then she told him that uh, she wanted to help him. And uh, for some reason, he let her go. Yeah, she talked about a description. And I, I believe he told her that he was the one that had kidnapped Valerie. Her description of his vehicle also matches the truck belonging to Valerie Shaw Hartzell. Police immediately take action. Once we knew that he was still in Valerie's car, we put out an all points bulletin. And I just couldn't fathom if he was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, why we couldn't find the man. But police now have no doubt the wave of crimes across Oklahoma are far from separate. They are all committed by the same man, and police feel the pressure to catch him before he strikes again. In May 1984, a series of violent crimes have been terrifying the people of Oklahoma. For weeks, police have no suspects and no reason to link the crimes. But connections are now clear, especially after one of the victims tells police her abductor was driving a vehicle belonging to Valerie Shaw Hartzell, another missing woman. It was around the 28th, 29th, 30th of May. Things started to come together. I was talking with a sheriff's deputy up in Vanita, and we were talking about some strange cases he had going, and I was telling him a little bit about our murder here. And the, odd thing about it is uh, the suspect descriptions were very similar, even down to a unique belt buckle. As well, there are now several matching physical descriptions of the perpetrator by victims who had escaped. Tulsa police had put together a composite sketch, and that was being shown. We had plastered description all over our newscast, and so had the other news stations and the other newspapers. So the word was out there. Police now assume they are looking for one man and know generally what he looks like, but are still unable to identify him. Detective Paul Crowder brings Ed Cash Jr. in to look at sketches of the suspect, hoping he can identify the man. Of course, I was very anxious and drove up to see the pictures. And he said, well, do you know this person? 
I said, no, I do not know that person. He said, are you sure you do not know him? I said, no, I don't know him. I have no idea who he is at all. And he says, well, do you think your father knew him? I said, not that I know of. I would have no way of knowing that. But the killer is getting sloppy, leaving clues to his identity behind. A pawn shop owner realizes one of his customers matches the media descriptions and contacts police. When he took Valerie's truck, or he took the club, which is a device that you put on the steering wheel and hooks to the brake. He took that device and pawned it in a uh, pawn shop. But he left his name, and uh, the guy actually looked at his driver's license and took the information off his driver's license. They had a serial number on it, and we were able to trace it back to her. At the same time, a witness comes forward with information about the car belonging to Jane Hilburn, the woman who had been strangled by the man claiming to be interested in buying her house. The witness tells police a relative of his had been driving a Camaro a few weeks before, just like the one he had seen broadcast in the media. He had come to Broken Arrow driving the Vanita victim's Camaro and was wanting to borrow some money from his relative. And we finally was able to put a name to that face. The person everyone is looking for is 30-year-old Gary Allen Walker, an Oklahoma man whose life reads like a textbook case of criminal behavior. He begins stealing from his family when he is just a small boy, progressing to more serious burglaries and theft as a young adult. He spends more than seven years in prisons and mental institutions, where he is finally diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and receives at least 20 shock treatments. Gary had quite a few burglaries that he was responsible for. Had a real problem with staying out of trouble back then. I uh, was unable to ever hold a job very long, so he just kind of existed. Now, using Gary Allen Walker's prints, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation positively identifies the set of fingerprints from the Camaro as belonging to Walker. The case gets stronger because police know that the man in Hilburn's Camaro was the one who raped another woman. So Walker is tied to that crime as well. Steve Tiffey joins forces with authorities from other jurisdictions where similar kinds of murders and abductions have been reported. I believe there's 53 of us met in Tulsa and we just kind of laid everything out on the table of each one of them's cases and went over it. It was just a joint effort of the whole state of officers and, and some out-of-state officers that kind of put all this together. The final piece of the puzzle is the similarity in crime methods. The murder victims have been beaten and strangled. The rape victims abducted at knife point. Knowing conclusively the extent of Walker's crime spree, police conduct a nationwide manhunt. We have Broken Arrow Police, Tulsa, Craig County, LaFleur County, uh, FBI, the OSBI. I uh, had agencies over in Arkansas. They probably tapped about every resource they had. But I think they had a helicopter at the time, and it was up in the air. They had uh, dogs out searching. The one downside of all the publicity the case had was that the suspect also had that same information and was able to watch for uh, any of our cars. Of course, he had changed vehicles at least twice, so it was kind of hard to keep up with what he might be driving at the time. The public keeps a watchful eye, but it is not enough. Early June in Van Buren, Arkansas, Walker breaks into a home and threatens to kill two local residents. Walker leaves them scared but alive and escapes into the darkness with their vehicle. They summons the police. Tulsa already had information who he was, what he looked like. Somebody had spotted the vehicle at a bar. I got a phone call at home that he had been spotted in a bar. We sent officers to that bar, but he had just left and they missed him. He was 
doing his best to stay one step ahead of us. And for the most part, he was quite successful. But customers at the bar tell police that the people Walker left with live in a nearby mobile home. The great thing about it was he had left not knowing that we were en route. Therefore, he was not really trying to hide from that point as much as he had been. Police quickly and quietly surround the mobile home. Through the window, they see Walker having a drink with his friends. They prepare to storm the trailer and end his wave of terror. In nearly four weeks, communities in Oklahoma and surrounding states have been terrorized by a series of rapes, kidnappings, and murders. A nationwide manhunt for suspected serial killer Gary Allen Walker eventually leads police to a mobile home in Tulsa where he is drinking with friends. Police rush the home and burst through the door, catching Walker off guard. They located him and, and arrested him without incident, that we had no problem once he was, once he was cornered. In just a matter of seconds, Police end a crime spree that has spanned more than three weeks and destroyed the lives of so many. When he was apprehended, I think he was just tired of running. I was relieved in the sense that I knew that he could do no more harm to any of the family. Once in custody, police interrogate Walker hoping to learn the location of the missing women. The truth is hard to take. Walker tells them Margaret Bell, Valerie Shaw Hartzell, and Janet Jewell are dead. Police visit the families of the victims to give them the terrible news. So at that moment, just all hope was gone. Pretty much you just lose it. Everybody's, of course, crying and, and upset. My grandmother came to the house, and my grandmother was in tears. I asked her what was wrong, and she couldn't answer me. And I said, it's mom, isn't it? And she said, yes. But I spent most of the next 30 or 45 minutes trying to comfort my grandmother because she was in such shock. I never hit the shock stage because I had already accepted it before. I for sure found out. With the arrest of Gary Allen Walker, the media frenzy takes off. Once they captured Gary Allen Walker, it, it, it just exploded. So we had one crew going out to where the scene of the arrest was. We had another crew going to the courthouse. He uh, confessed to all the crimes that he was linked or suspected of committing, and maybe even some that he wasn't suspected, but he spilled his guts, basically. Holding nothing back, Walker tells police how his crime spree began. He was hitchhiking between Broken Arrow and Collinsville when he was picked up by Eddie Cash. Apparently, the man got enough information from Dad to f figure out the area that he lived in and uh, went back to the neighborhood and found out where he lived. Walker tells police he originally meant to rob Eddie Cash, not kill him. But when Cash came home unexpectedly, he had to do something so Cash couldn't identify him. As he was about to break into the house, Mr. Cash pulled up, which surprised this young man. He jumped into the bushes and waited for Mr. Cash to, to go into his home. So he went up, knocked on the door. When Mr. Cash came to the door, he struck Mr. Cash in the head several times with a brick and then tied a electrical cord around Mr. Cash's neck. Walker then reveals how he abducted his female victims at knife point, strangled them to death, and then discarded their bodies wherever convenient starting with Margaret Bell. He ended up uh, going with her, went across to Arkansas and Tennessee and Kentucky. 
He killed her and ditched her body up in a wooded area near Paducah, Kentucky. Then took her vehicle and drove to Branson, Missouri, where he broke down. Uh, ended up hitchhiking out of there. With Walker telling them where to look for Margaret Bell's car, Steve Tiffey contacts police in Branson. We contact them back and had them preserve the car. And then we went to uh, Branson, Missouri, where the car was impounded and processed the car. We were looking for fingerprints in the vehicle of uh, a possible suspect, any type of trace evidence of hair, or body fluids, or, or anything of that nature. While inspecting the car, police find more than they were expecting. Eddie Cash's suitcase was found in her vehicle. It had some of Eddie Cash's uh, clothing and his name on the, on the suitcase. So that kind of tied the suspect to the Cash killing and Miss Bell's murder. From Walker's confession, Margaret Bell's body is located by authorities in Kentucky. They'd found a white female's body at a tobacco farm just off the interstate. Her body was nude except for the, the uh, clothing tied around her neck that was later determined that was the cause of death was strangulation. In the case of Janet Jewell, Walker shows how devious he could be. He uh, saw her car parked in front of a store, and he saw her go inside. So he raised the car and unplugged the, uh, the cord going into her uh, coil wire. And when she came out and tried to start her car, she was unable to get it started. So then he, he asked if he could help. And uh, he raised the hood and messed around for a little bit and then put the coil wire back in the coil. And then asked if he could have her slide over so he could try to start it. And when she did, pulled a knife on her, abducted her, took her to uh, a remote area, raping and killing her. Uh, left her body uh, off the roadway. Valerie was abducted from the parking lot at Knife Point. We found out that she was raped several times. He was constantly threatening her life, and that she was begging for her life and saying, let me get back to my child. He forced her to go through drive throughs at banks a couple of times. And we were thinking, you know, at that point, well, that would have been the point to yell, to scream for help, to do anything, jump out of the car, and it didn't happen. So he must have had her tied up in some way or restrained. And that had to be horrible. Walker leads Detective Stanley Glanz to the bodies of Valerie Shaw Hartzell and Janet Jewell. Now, he directed us out a... Uh, a road in, in Tulsa County, and she was laying in a ditch. How he killed her. He took a towel and rolled it up and uh, uh, put it around her neck and strangled her. And uh, in fact, uh, he got really emotional and started crying when we found Valerie. And then we got in the car again and headed towards the pulpa uh, looking for Janet Jewell. And uh, he took us down to the creek where he had left her. And I found her laying over a, a tree across the creek. Janet Jewell, he choked her with a cable. Now knowing how Gary Allen Walker killed his victims, the question everyone wants answered is, why? He had been convicted one or two times for stealing cars, and the victims had always come in and testified against him. So he felt if he killed those people that they, they couldn't testify against him. He felt he could stay in the car a lot longer than if he'd just steal it. So if he killed them, then he didn't have to worry about them reporting it to the police. 
One of the disturbing facts to emerge is that Walker had just finished serving a five-year prison sentence only three months prior to his horrific crime spree. With the confessions and victims' bodies found, the community gears up for Gary Allen Walker's impending trial, anxious to see justice served. But for the victims' families, it means reliving the torture all over again. After a 27-day rampage across several southern states, Gary Allen Walker is arrested. The communities are relieved knowing a madman is behind bars. Since Walker's crimes have occurred in several jurisdictions, trials are scheduled in separate counties. For the families and friends of the victims, it means coming face to face with the man who forever destroyed their lives. The first time I saw Gary Allen Walker was at the courthouse for trial, and they were bringing him in, and he actually walked pretty close to me, and I just had that feeling. It's just kind of like when blood runs cold. You just um, feel really empty and just angry. And it always has stuck in my mind that that is the face, that's the look that every one of his victims saw, probably when they were being killed. During the trial, the increasingly grotesque details take their toll on family and friends, including colleagues of Valerie Shaw Hartzell. They showed photos of her body when it was found. At one point, I had to leave the courtroom and go out and just sit in the hallway for a while and then go back in. And that, that had never happened to me before uh, covering a murder case. Unable to have Walker's confessions thrown out, his lawyer attempts to evoke the sympathy of the jurors to downgrade his client's sentence from death to life imprisonment. His sister talked about what a horrible childhood that he had. But I think a, a relative of one of the victims said it best. He said, well, a lot of people have terrible childhoods, have horrible things happen to them, but they don't go out and murder and rape people. And I thought that was pretty apropos. During deliberations, the jury requests a tape of Walker's confessions. In the recording, Walker says he had no reason to kill his victims. He also says he knows he's going to die for what he has done and admits that if he was free, he would do it again. It didn't take long for him to be uh, convicted of the murder. When it's over, Walker receives the death penalty for killing Eddie Cash. He receives six life sentences and 700 years for his other crimes. I definitely felt it was just. There was some of the members of the family and some of, the, of my very close friends that were definitely against it, but I, I felt that it was something that needed to be done. There was a sense of accomplishment. When you dedicate that much resources to a case, it, uh, when it concludes, you're very pleased. In a horrific period in May 1984, Gary Allen Walker killed five people raped and kidnapped several more, and changed the lives of their family and friends forever. I didn't sleep well at night. I had my husband up in the middle of the night chasing ghosts because I would swear somebody was in the house. I was pretty much a nervous wreck and afraid of my own shadow for many years to come. I sought counseling immediately after, and probably the last two to three years, I've been able to do some healing. I will always remember my father as a very loving, caring person. He cared for his family. He cared for everyone he came in contact with. After a 16-year legal battle, Gary Allen Walker is finally executed by lethal injection on January 13th. 2000. It was time. Valerie had been my friend. I just needed some closure to it, and it closed it. 
didn't fix it. And didn't fix it to her family and her child. But it was some closure. <laughs>